morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunday morning here at Calvary Chapel Grants Pass. Okay, let's try that again. I know, right? So, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunday morning here at Calvary Chapel Grants Pass. It is good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Amen. Okay, before we invite the worship team up here to uh, lead us in worship, just a couple of things to go over. First and foremost, today's the first day of spring. Yeah, I know. We are officially done with winter and it couldn't have come any sooner. Now just bring on the 100 degree days. Yeah. Oh. Okay, so I see we have a house divided here. So all of the normal people who like 100 degrees weather come on this side of the church and we'll pray for the rest over there. Not the first time I've been told that. All right, so focus, Kevin. Uh, just a reminder that tonight um, we have prayer, and then Tim will be um, ha will have the apologetics class here in the sanctuary or the apologetic service here in the in the sanctuary. So come join us for that if you can. And then also uh, just a reminder that. After this service, we are having baptisms. So, yeah. Uh, so, if, if you can stay um, and celebrate with us what God's doing in the church and in and through the people that are here. So, we're really excited about it. And if you've never been baptized, but you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the water's warm. Come join us. You know, it's one of those things we do out of obedience. And if you never have, uh, we would love for you to get baptized today. So <clears throat> then also a uh, quick reminder, the men's conference is coming up in Reading April 1st through the 3rd. So we have a sign up sheet out there for those who would like to stay in one of the houses that we've rented. If you would like to want to be a part of that, then make sure you sign up today before you leave because today is the cutoff so that we know how many men are going, et cetera, et cetera. So um, please, if you plan on going, um, visit the sign up sheet out in the foyer before you leave today. Let's see what else we got going on here. Uh, then also just a reminder that uh, we have a couple of things going on. We have uh, the field trip for the kids that are 10 to 14 to the gun range on the 23rd. So if you would like to go, you can talk to, uh, to Ed or uh, he can give you more information about it. It will be very well controlled. There are gonna be law enforcement, et cetera, there to be there with the kids, but just thought it would be a fun time out with the kids. I'll be there with a uh, bulletproof vest on. No. So, and then also, uh, for those of you who teach the youth or the children right now, there will be a meeting after second service next Sunday, so please join, plan on joining us for that. And then in the near future, for anybody who would like to volunteer uh, to be a part of what we do in the youth department, we'll have a meeting uh, here in the near future, but this meeting next week will just be for those who are currently teaching. Just to update you on a few things, all that kind of stuff. Let's see, what else we got going on? Most importantly, we will, before we know it, be celebrating the resurrection of our Lord. Yes. <laughs> Easter is coming up, obviously, and so um, Easter's April 17th, but we have a whole weekend planned of events and outreaches. So on the 15th, which is Good Friday, from 12 to 1, we, uh, Pastor Aaron will be leading us in a, just a short uh, Good Friday service. And then afterwards, if there's anybody who would like to stay and volunteer, we will be prepping the sanctuary um, for... Saturday, and what's going to go on Saturday is Saturday at 9 a.m. We are going to have a community breakfast where we invite the community in, um, you know, just 
anybody who's and everybody is welcome. Uh, we will invite them to church on Sunday, obviously, and, and it'll just be a good time for you know, us to really show our love to the community. Then right afterwards at 10, we'll have kids' activities. Uh, Cheryl was telling me we've, we've rented one of those big blow-up obstacle courses and all that kind of stuff. That's right. And so um, if I get done playing in it, then we'll allow the kids to play in it. <laughs> But uh, no, so we have, we're going to have a bunch of activities for the kids, a treasure hunt, all different kinds of things. So, uh, you know, to engage the kids. And once again, the whole point of inviting them so that they can hear the message on Sunday about the power of the resurrection. Um, because, you know, that's what all of this, that's why all of us are here. If it wasn't for the power of the resurrection and living that resurrected life, none of us would be here right now. So... Um, you know, and it's the one, it's an opportunity for us to really be able to engage in the community, in our culture, uh, to show them what a resurrected life looks like. Uh, and so please plan on being with us. And if you can't, please plan on being in prayer for those events. There's still a lot to do. There are sign-up sheets out in the foyer. So if you can, please join us for that. And speaking of resurrected lives and God performing miracles in the lives of, of people within this church, we have a U-turn graduation. So if Monaco can come up and some of the leaders from the church can come up, we will lay hands on her and, and uh, ask God to bless her. Come on, you're the center of attention. Get right here. All right, so let's get our Kodak moment here. Jesus. Okay. Wait, we got more. So, wait, wait, wait. Sorry. Can you give it my mom? Come on, we can only act. I can only keep this smile on for so long. Jesus. Yeah. Okay. All right. Do we need to have that conversation again? Okay. All right, let's, let's lift Monica up in prayer. Lord, we are so grateful, as we talked about earlier, of um, just your resurrection power. Lord, we're so grateful that we as a church can just watch it through the men and women that you bring through the ministry of U-Turn, Lord. God, just the, we're so excited uh, for the good work that you've begun in Monaco because we know that you're faithful to complete it. And Lord, we're uh, excited to see as she enters into this next season of her walk with you, Lord. God, we pray for your divine blessing upon her. Lord, you, that you would just put your hedge of protection around her, Lord. And God, that um, you would just shine in and through her. So, Lord, we just pray for your blessings upon her now. Lord, just be with her. And God, we just uh, give you all the glory for all that you've done in and through Monaco's life. God, we expect great things uh, because you're involved. And so it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Congratulations. Hello. Oh. Oh. See, as a perfect reminder to let's silence our phones if we can. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Matt. That's good to know. <laughs> okay, would the worship team get up here and rescue me? <laughs> and, but while they're on their way up here, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Lord, once again, we're just so grateful uh, that you give us the awesome privilege of uh, just being able to come here and uh, celebrate your goodness as a family. Lord, I pray that as the worship team uh, gets ready to lead us in worship, that you would help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. And later as we 
uh, listen to your word go forth, Lord. I pray that you would give us hearts to heed what your spirit has to speak to us today and the courage to be doers of your word and not hearers only. So Lord, uh, we just ask as your word tells us where two or three are gathered, you're here in our presence. We invite you in and just ask that you would have your way now. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. amen. Good morning, everybody. Great place to be. Please stand up if you can. there. Please be seated. Five, four. 
and deacons to come forward and take this morning tithes and offerings. So if you would, uh, let's go before the Lord and ask him to uh, bless the tithes and offerings. Lord, thank you for allowing us the awesome privilege of being able to give back a little bit of what you've given us. Lord, I pray that as we take the morning tithes and offerings, God, you would give the leadership here at this church wisdom on how best to use those funds, Lord, how we can uh, glorify you uh, the most out of them. So, Lord, I pray that you would uh, bless the giving and bless those uh, who are the givers also, Lord. So, God, we just thank you. We praise you for all that you're doing in and through this church. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old the starry crown, good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sisters, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, sisters, let's go down, down in the river to pray. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that
Children, we have a song coming up we could use your help on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow, I love that enthusiasm. <laughs> we should all be like that. <laughs> well, thanks everybody for standing. Oh yeah, I don't thanks have for to, standing everybody. Great I job. don't have to stand, but those two do, so. <laughs> Could you stand and play? Life is over 
One day we will. Amen. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's stretch out our hand towards these uh, kids and some acting like kids and <laughs> ask God to just bless their service also. Lord, we thank you for just the youthful exuberance the kids have when they come up here, God. We thank you for just the way that they worship you. Lord, we could all learn a lesson from them. Lord, I pray that as the kids go to their classroom now, that you would just bless them with your knowledge and uh, your hope. Lord, I pray for the teachers. You would give them patience and your words to speak into these young ones' lives. So, Lord, be with us now, Lord, as the kids go to their class. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And before you sit down, greet somebody, say hi. So while everybody's making their way back to their seats, uh, just, a, just a couple of things before we actually um, get started with the sermon. Just as we talked about the baptism uh, that we're going to have, so what we'll do just on a practical level is when I'm getting to the point um, where I'm getting ready to finish up the sermon, I will let you, those who are getting baptized, to know to go back and get changed and all that kind of stuff. And there will be, there will be people back there that will kind of guide you through it and help you through that. And then Pastor Aaron will come up here. He'll talk a minute about bapti baptism while I'm running upstairs to my office to change to baptize. So... So we'll do this as quickly as possible, but it will be a procedure here. So with that being said, um, if you would turn into your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 47, we're going to be talking about, what our, about our Christian walk, about our faith walk, and what it looks like, and how deep are we willing to go. How far are we willing to allow God to be in control so that we're out of control. Uh, you know, because it's true, we can't, God can't be con in control of our lives if we're controlling it, right? We have to give up that control so he, that he can have that control. And so we're going to talk about that uh, today, just about what that looks like as far as our walk goes with, with the Lord. And, and so, you know, this is a, a part of scripture that's always blessed me, and, and I've used it several times as an analogy before, but it just it really hits home to what we as a church uh, and as believers within the church deal with all the time. How deep are we willing to go? How far are we willing to submerge ourselves into God's will. And that's what, you know, I hear all the way, and that's easier said than done sometimes, you know. And, but it's definitely where our hearts should be, right? It definitely should be the will of what we want to do is to be completely out of control so that he can be in complete control. And so that's what, that's what we're going to talk about today. Ezekiel 47 Beginning in verse 1, it says, Then he brought me back to the door of the temple. Uh, first, let's just begin there. It says, he brought me back. In other words, it could say, he led me back. You know, talking about God. We, on Wednesday nights, went through all of the Christophanies or Theophanies, you know, that God appearing in the Old Testament prior to uh, the birth of Jesus. And I believe this is one of them too, you know, where it's saying, he brought me back to the temple. He brought me back to the place of worship. You know, he brought, it's important because as we go through these verses, just as part of the setup, it continually says, and he brought, and he brought, and he brought, because Ezekiel here is allowing God to lead him into the deeper waters, into, you know, flowing in his spirit. And so catch on to that as we read these verses and then we go on at that. It's, uh, it's a matter of Ezekiel being led as God brings him to these places within his faith, faith walk. So it says, Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple towards the east. For the front of the temple faced east. 
The water was flowing from under the right side of the temple, south of the altar. He brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside to the outer gateway that faces east. And there was water running out on the right side. And when the man went out to the east with the line in his hand, he measured 1,000 cubits and he brought me through the waters. The waters came up to my ankles. Again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through the waters. The waters came up to my knees. Again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through the water. It came up to my waist. Again, he measured 1,000, and it was a river that I could not cross, for the water was too deep, water in which one must swim, a river that could not be crossed. He said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? Then he brought me and returned me to the bank of the river. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word. God, I pray that as we talk about these verses here in Ezekiel, Lord, that you would just use them to increase our faith, increase our understanding of you, Lord. And God, that you would just give us the zeal to lose control so that you can be in control. Be with us now, Lord, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So just a little background to think about. In the book of Ezekiel, you know, it, it, Ezekiel, when he wrote the book, it was really kind of a threefold purpose to the book. The first one, it was to explain that Judah must be judged for their disobedience, right? And for those of you who come regularly on Wednesday nights, it was a pattern all through the Old Testament, wasn't it? Where Judah would, uh, you know, become disobedience, they would be punished, they would go into captivity, whatever the case may be. Then when they were at their lowest of the lowest, they'd put their eyes back on God, they would repent, and then they would be blessed again, and then they're being blessed, then after a while they become complacent, and with complacency comes compromise, and with compromise they're right back into the disobedience, and the cycle went on and on and on throughout the Old Testament, uh, you know, just as it has in our own lives, right? And so that's, what it, that's one of the purposes here, uh, you know, uh, Ezekiel saying, hey, you're going to be judged for your disobedience. But, you know, just like our God, although, you know, there's judgment here that's coming to Judah, the other reasons why this book was written was also God's character in the sense that the other reason was to encourage the remnant of, of Judah through prophecies of the glorious future restoration of Judah. You know, that God wasn't going to forsake his people, right? Whereas we are unfaithful at times, whereas we, you know, compromise, we do these things. God never does. He is always faithful, you know, and always will be. It's part of his character. It's part of his nature. He's immutable. It never changes. He is always faithful. And so, you know, that's part of it, too, that even though they were disobedience, and they were going to unfortunately have to suffer the consequences of it. Uh, you know, these were still uh, the apple of God's eye, and there was going to be a future restoration for them. And uh, God wanted to make sure through Ezekiel that Judah understood this. And the third one was the, the uh, to emphasize the preeminence of God's glory and His character. Right? Like I said, um, God is on the throne. God is in control and always was and always will be. That will never change. I don't care how wacky this world gets. It doesn't matter because the one thing that we can always count assured is that he's on the throne. He's in control and his will will be done. Amen? So those are kind of the, the purposes um, that Ezekiel was given to write this book. And it's a beautiful book. You know, it, it's, um, as you go through Ezekiel, there's a, just a lot of information there. And of course, we're not going over it today, but um, it's a great book to read. And so as we go, as we go through this, you know, um, and it talks about the waters being ankle deep and then knee deep and waist deep and then, you know, above uh, Ezekiel's head. We're going to see some significance to our own walk. 
Because let's face it, um, you know, that first stage of our salvation is simply we're on the shore, right? We're safe. Uh, every once in a while, you know, we might get a little bit of the mist of the river and, and feel the cooling effect of the river, but we're not in the river. We're just kind of observing the river. We're, on our, we're in our safe space. You know, it doesn't take any faith to feel comfortable. It doesn't take any faith to feel secure because we're on that solid ground. We can see where we're at. There's no faith needed, is there? You know, but praise the Lord, we're even at the river in, in this analogy in the sense that we're saved. And that's kind of the first stage, you know, it's, it's what someone referred to in between services as the pew sitters, the ones who come on Sunday or whatever the case may be, and they come to church, they feel good, they're saved, they love the Lord, but it ends there, right? And, but God, that's not what God wants from any of us, right? He wants us to go deeper. He wants to t us to take those steps of faith. He wants us like I said, to be out of control so that he can be in control. And so what we'll see is a progression here uh, as, uh, you know, a believer matures and trusts God more. He goes deeper and deeper, you know, as, as the tagline's been for a couple years here, you know, we're going deeper so that we can go farther. And it's so true. And we're going to, we'll see that throughout these scriptures. So as this, as the verses go on, in verse 3, it says, And when the man went out to the east, and the line in his hand, he measured 1,000 cubits, and he brought me through the waters. The waters came up to my ankles. So this is that first part. That's where we first start taking those steps of faith, isn't it? We're no longer observing. We're no longer on the dry ground looking at the river. No, we've taken that first step of faith. We're actually in the water. But we're still safe, aren't we? We're, we're not getting too far out into the river yet. Um, we're starting to understand obedience and, and God's calling because we've taken that step in the river. But we're still in that safe, <coughs> excuse me, we're still in that safe space where we can easily jump back onto the, the dry ground and, and be there, right? So, so whereas we've taken that first step, we still are not getting far enough away from the shore that we can't, when we feel uncomfortable, just jump back on the dry ground and, and, and be there, go back to where we're comfortable. But it's a good start because like I said, we're starting to submit. We're starting to understand and we're starting to wanna take that step of faith into God's will for our lives. It's where we really start understanding the scripture such which is Galatians 2.20. That says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself to me. You know, it's where we understand um, that it's God. You know, I've been crucified uh, with Christ. It's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. It's where we start seeking for and understanding and wanting the will of God in our lives. We no longer want to live for our own selfish pursuits. We want to start stepping out in faith and taking those and living a life uh, that's in God's perfect will. It's where we start dying to our self wants and needs and we start living for Christ who is in us. You know, and, and it's interesting as we go on this faith journey, you know, as we do, the one thing that I know and I've experienced in my own life is whenever God takes something out of my life, he replaces it with something so much better, something so much more fulfilling, something so much, uh, you know, greater than I could have ever imagined. But it takes us to get into the river, you know, and when we are able to give up those self desires and allow God to work, that's when it, our life really becomes, uh, you know, meaningful. It's when we really start looking at kingdom purposes. So even being ankle deep, we've started that surrender process and we really uh, understand it. You know, and it's one of those things where with it also comes responsibility too. 
you know, we, we're able, we're now mature enough that we can discern God's will. And we have enough maturity that we understand that we're supposed to be in the river. But at this point, how much faith do we have? We don't have all the faith to get into the river. But God's called us to lose control. And I want to just share a story from Scripture, uh, you know, that shows this perfectly. If you would turn the 1 Samuel chapter 15 with me, we'll see a perfect example of someone who, who is after God's will and then later loses it. Now, 1 Samuel 15 should be pretty familiar with most of you. You know, Saul is at this point in history has been anointed king. Um, the prophet Samuel uh, speaks to Saul and tells him, hey, I need you to go out, or God wants you to go out and um, kill the Amalekites, and I want you to utterly destroy them, leave nothing behind. Take nothing. I don't want you to take anything. I've delivered your enemy into your hands, and here is your marching order. So in 1 Samuel 15, beginning in verse 1, it says, Samuel also said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore, heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus say the, says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them, but kill both man, woman, infant, missing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So, you know, he was given pretty specific orders here, wasn't he? He was saying, I've delivered your enemy into your hands, and here's what you're supposed to do. Utterly destroy everything. You know, it wasn't because, uh, you know, God is a vengeful God, whatever. It was because he knew if they didn't destroy that whole culture, that whole society, that culture and that society was going to destroy Israel. And so in here, he gave them very specific instructions. Do not save anything. Get rid of it all because it will end up destroying you instead of you destroying it. And so, you know, that's once again just God's character of how much he loves us that he's saying, look, you can't. You can't have any of it. You can't participate in any of this. And so uh, as the story continues in, in verse 9, it's a, we really see a telling part of the scripture. It says, But Saul and the people uh, spared Agag, the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless that they utterly destroyed. You see that? So the things that had no value to Saul or to the people, they were more than happy to destroy, right? They were more than happy to get rid of those things because they had no value. It's like, oh yeah, we'll get rid of all the stuff that's despised and, and you know, whatever, it's, it's no good. Yeah, we'll get rid of that, Lord. Oh, we'll be faithful there. But the good stuff, the choice stuff, uh, I ain't gonna do it. And so what we see here is compromise, isn't it? We see Saul and the people compromising, saying, you know what? I will destroy the despised and the worthless things, but those choice things, I don't have it in me to destroy. I'm going to keep them. It matters more for me to have those things than it does to follow your will. And unfortunately, when we, comp when we have those kind of compromises in our lives, we suffer the consequences, don't we? Because, you know, the bottom line with this part of it here is, God wants our best, not our rest, right? God wants our very best. And, and that's what it is here. You know, God, the very best by God would have been simple, just to be obedient to what he spoke through the prophet Samuel. Just destroy it. Why do you need it? You know, I hate when my pocket starts buzzing in from a phone call in the middle of preaching, but... Uh, <laughs> Anyways, so as we, 
you know, as we see here, we see them unwilling to take that step of faith and give it all over to God. Although God delivered them from their enemies, although God delivered them and was blessing them through this process, they weren't willing to give up those choice things, were they? And so, unfortunately, if we, and we see where this really, how this really begins in verse 12. In verse 12 of chapter 15, it says, So when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul went to Carmel, and indeed he set up monuments for himself. Uh Uh-oh, right? Any time that we start elevating ourselves, our will uh, over God's, we're setting monuments up for ourselves. Whenever we start taking our eyes off of God and we're putting them back on us or on anybody else, we are setting monuments up for ourselves. And that never goes well because we serve a jealous God. We serve a God who deserves and demands all of the glory. Because as we've talked about it before, but by the grace of God, you know, none of us would be here. It's but by the grace of God uh, that we even, uh, you know, have the privilege and the hope and the knowledge of knowing that we have eternity promised to us. You know, it's only by the grace of God, because the one thing I do know, the more mature I get and the closer to God's perfect will for my life I get, the more of a wretch I realize I am. I'm not a good person. None of us are. Right. But. We only realize that as we, as we draw closer to God and we compare our lives compared to his, right? That we truly understand who we are. But that is a, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. You know, all this stuff, self-love and, you know, self-appreciation and all this uh, that, you know, you hear preached out in the culture is a bunch of hogwash. You know, not saying that we shouldn't, you know, um, worry about our mental health and everything else. But if we focus more on God than our problems, then a lot of the problems that we're focusing on would go away. You know, because as we always say as a church, uh, you know, I don't care what the problem is. I don't care what ills you. The answer is always Jesus. So, you know, when we start focusing on us, 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 and we start building those monuments, we start getting in trouble. You know, because we're taking our mind off of the one who was actually able and putting them on us. We're going to uh, we're going to stumble. We're going to fall. We're going to do you know, we're never going to be perfect like the God we serve. So then in verse 14, it continues on and it says. um, But Samuel said, what then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen, which I hear? So Samuel's kind of confronting him here saying, hey, didn't I uh, a few verses back tell you to destroy everything? What's all these animals I hear? What's going on, Saul? You know, knowing full well the answer. And then, uh, you know, we really see the truth behind it all in verse 15 and on it says and Saul said they have brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God and the rest we have utterly destroyed so let's stop there so notice how first of all Saul instead of when confronted repenting and saying I messed up right? God forgive me. What's he do? He shifts blame. It was the people. The people brought them here. It's not my fault. I didn't do anything about it, but oh yeah, they happened to be here and I just happened to be king and I could tell them to destroy them all and they would have destroyed them, but oh no, you know, it's their fault. Remind you of, I guess us men are good at shifting blame, aren't we? You know, thinking about uh, in the garden, it was the woman you brought me, Lord. It wasn't my fault. It was the woman you brought. It's really your fault, God. I, you know, I was just an uh, innocent bystander. And next thing I know, I'm eating uh, some fruit and, <laughs> and stuff happens. It, it's really your fault because you brought her here and she was the one who gave it to me, God. So really, I think you need to repent to yourself. I mean, that's kind of what that's kind of what's being said. Right. And it's kind of, you know, I say it in a in a you know, joking manner. But if you really think about the ridiculousness of sin, 
That's what it is. And when we, instead of just, uh, you know, repenting and, and uh, confessing our sin, we start shifting blame to other people. Well, it wasn't really my fault. It was, you know, whatever. The women you gave me, it was the people, Lord. Of course, I'm leading the people, but it was their fault. And then verse 16, Samuel says, Then Samuel said to Saul, I love this. I love how direct Samuel is. He says, Then Samuel said to Saul, Be quiet. And I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. In other words, it's like, Saul, quit lying. I don't even want to hear it anymore. You're making excuses. Just be quiet. Right? Okay, I'll say it. He's basically telling him, shut up. <laughs> and it says, as that verse continues, and it says, and he said to him, speak on. So Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? Wow, that verse cuts. When you were little in your eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? In other words, when, when you were humble, were you not lifted up to lead the tribes of Israel? But now that you are setting, making monuments for yourself, uh, you've taken your eyes off of me and you've put, in, you've put them on yourself. You know, when you were little in your eyes, when you were humble, you know, because let's be honest, as Proverbs tells us, you know, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. You know, God will humble the proud. And we see it here in this story where God is humbling the uh, Saul in his pride, dealing with his pride. When you were little in your eyes. You know, because the Bible is very clear that when we become Christians and we start getting in that ankle deep water, the one thing that should be a characteristic of our faith is one that um, we start esteeming others above ourselves, as it says. And secondly, that we ought not think too highly of ourselves, right? Because we're starting to really understand who we are in our nature, our sin nature. And so, you know, Saul... When he was little in his eyes, he was usable by God. But now that he's building monuments, he's no longer able to be used by God. And that's a, that's a frightening place to be, isn't it? It's a very frightening place to be. And so as these verses go on, and, and we'll kind of get back to our main text here in a minute, uh, we see the consequences of pride. We see the consequences of not being obedient to God's will, to his call in our lives. And so in verse 20, it says, And Saul said to Samuel, But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. Once again, you know, uh, in government, we called it plausible deniability. Well, I didn't No, It really wasn't me, you know, whatever. Um, and gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. Right. That part's true. God told him to go. He gave him a mission to go defeat the Amalekites. He did that part. So far, so good. Right. But the rest of it says. Um, and brought back Agag, king of um, the Amalek. Amalek. Jeez, I can't speak. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people, once again, you know, the people. Um, took the plunder, sheep and oxen, and the best of the things which have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. So he's saying, oh, Lord, you know, really, we have a much better plan than you. So what we're going to do, yeah, we didn't quite destroy everything like you told us to do, but we took the best of the stuff and we were going to sacrifice it to you. So they, what they were trying to do, what Saul was basically doing is couching his sin in religiosity. He was saying, you know, Lord, yeah, I really not being obedient, but hey, I'm not going to be obedient in your name. I'm going to sacrifice it to you. That's kind of what we do sometimes too, huh? It's like, oh yeah, I'm not going to feel, fulfill the will of God. I'm not going to follow it, but uh, you know, I'm going to couch it in religiosity and I'm going to serve and I'm going to do all these things, but I'm not really serving with the right heart. I'm serving, you know, as I'm serving, I'm kind of looking over to see who's noticing me and how hard I work and, and really wanting the accolades. And I, I want that attaboy type of thing, you know, and I want people to see that I'm serving and know everything that I do. But that's not God's heart, is it? 
You know, uh, God wants us to serve with a pure heart, doesn't he? You know, as the old saying goes, uh, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. You know, God could care less about our service. What he cares about is the condition of our heart, right? And so that's what he's saying here. Yeah, you went out on this mission. You defeated, uh, you know, the... Amalek and the Amalekites, but you didn't follow my will. And now you're trying to blame it on the people. You're shifting blame and you're trying to do it in such a way that you make it sound like you're super religious. Oh, I just did it for you, Lord. I wouldn't sacrifice anything but the best for you, God. No, that's not what God wanted. And so as it, the verses continue in 22 and 23 here, it says, and Samuel said, as the Lord is great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice, as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. He's, you know, those are some crazy verses, aren't they? It's saying, you know what? I could care less about how much you sacrifice. I don't care about how much time you spend at this church. I don't care about how much, you know, you do for religiosity sakes. Uh, what I care about is that you're obedient to what I tell you to do. Uh, you know, that's all I care about. The rest of it means nothing because God sees our heart. You know, he knows why we're serving. And so we see that here, you know, it's like, I want your obedience, not your sacrifice. Because you can't tithe enough money to make up for your lack of obedience. You can't serve enough, uh, you know, to make up for your lack of obedience. It says, I want your obedience because when I have your obedience, then I'm in control. When you're following my will without compromise, then I can work in and through you. And that's what we see. And, and, and so, you know, all of this story is just to say when we're first taking that step of faith in that water, we're starting to deal with these issues of surrender with obedience, aren't we? Because like I said, when we're on the shore there, we can run around, and do whatever we want, right? We can get a lounge chair, we can sunbathe, we can do whatever. But when we start getting deeper and deeper in that water, we start losing control and those steps require more faith. And so um, let's go back to Ezekiel and we'll talk about those different levels. Like I said, we talked about being on the beach we talked about being ankle deep. Now let's talk about being knee deep. So as the verses continue, it says um, in verse four, it says, and again, he measured 1000 and brought me through the waters. The waters came up to my knees. So once again, we're at that place now where the water comes up to our knees where, uh, you know, we're starting to have to struggle a little bit more, aren't we? When you're in knee deep water, you can't necessarily see what's underneath you. When you're in that knee deep water, you're have, having to take those steps of faith because you're not sure. You can't see the solid ground. There might be a rock there. There might be something pointy. There might be a, a depression there that you fall in. You just don't know. So when you're in that that um, knee deep water, the current, if you're not careful, can sweep you away, right? So you're having the trust in God more and in his spirit as it flows through. So when you're in that knee deep water, you know, you have to trust God. And so as he's going through this, this walk here, you know, it, it's also one of those points where we really, it causes us to have more faith in God because we need God's strength to continue on uh, you know, wading through the water, don't we? Because it becomes more difficult to walk on our own power when we're in that knee-deep water. But that's not where God wants us to stop at, that knee-deep water, is it? The next part that Ezekiel talks about is waist-deep water. And so as the verses continue here, and I'm kind of summarizing this now, to be honest with you, because we're running quickly running out of time, but I want to get to the important parts here. It says, and again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through the waters up to my waist. Okay, now waist deep water is a whole different ball game, isn't it? So when you're, if any of you have ever been in a river that has any kind of current and you're waist deep, 
you're really starting a struggle. You can just as easily be, uh, you know, uh, swept away down the river as anything, and you definitely can't see what's underneath you. You're struggling. You're not, it's not as easy on your own power to go, right? It's a lot easier to go with the, the flow, the spirit, and uh, down the river than it is to try to walk upstream against the river, isn't it? Just the same way with God's will. When we're submersed to this point in our lives, uh, you know, God is starting to take control. God's, we've given up a certain amount of, of control in our lives because we know uh, the river could take us down the, at any time, right? But still, that's a good place to be. Don't get me wrong. It's not a bad place to be, but it's still not where God wants us. So the next level is where we're going to see where God really wants us. Uh, you know, and, and, it's, and it says... Again, he measured 1,000, and it was a river that I could not cross, for the water was too deep, water in, in which one must swim, a river that could not be crossed. He said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? Then he brought me and returned me to the bank of the river. All right, this is the place where God wants us. He wants us submerged. He wants us at a place where we no longer have our own footing. He wants us in a place where we're over our head in the spirit, right? It's just where we're trusting God. We've given up complete control and must rely on God to take us, right? And control us. Just as when, you know, you can no longer um, have that firm foundation anymore that we're going by faith. That's where God wants us. Like I said, when we give up complete control, he'll take control. And that's where this part of the river is. And this is what we see here, you know, that he's not able to touch the bottom anymore. Uh, you know, he was totally in the, immersed in the spirit. You know, he was going to go wherever that river took him. Just as when we're totally immersed in the spirit, we'll go wherever, you know, the spirit is leading us. And speaking of being led, those of you who are going to be baptized, now would be a good time to go get changed. That would have been about five minutes ago in the sermon, but I was kind of in the spirit and forgot to mention it. So if, if you haven't already, go. There will be pastors out here that will meet you and uh, discuss a little bit and, and get you all taken care of. So uh, I know we got a couple of baptisms. If there's anybody else feeling led, go now. Where, so, where? Out this door, go see Pastor Aaron over there. Amen. All right. So, like I said, as we go deeper, as we experience this, when we're no longer um, relying our, on our own abilities, but we're totally trusting God, there's no p better place to be. Like I said, and this is where God wants us. This is where Saul was when he was first anointed king, but soon became big in his own eyes, wasn't it? This is where God wants us fully immersed in him. You know, because let's, let's face it, God wants, like I said, God wants the best of us. He doesn't just want the rest, the leftovers. No, he wants the very best. And the funny thing is, is anybody who's mature enough to have walked with the Lord for any period of time, uh, they know it's true too, uh, that whatever we give up, God replaces it with so much more. And, you know, so let's think about this in our walk real quick as we kind of close this. And, and um, we have a few applications with it. When we're first saved and we're on the shore, it's safe, isn't it? We're in control. You know, every once in a while, God may use us. We feel the mist of the water being up there. But then God calls us deeper. He calls us to that ankle deep water. That ankle deep water requires little effort and it makes for a shallow Christian, doesn't it? Because we're not really taking those steps of faith. We're not really using our, uh, you know, uh, trusting in God fully. We're just ankle deep. Anybody can be that. You know, yes, you're a Christian and you're saved, but. Um, I can't even see. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Focus, people. All right. 
So that ankle deep water, like I said, makes for shallow Christians, doesn't it? Because you're not really venturing out much. But then God calls us to that knee deep water, which requires a little bit more effort. But it's still based on our own abilities, isn't it? We're still pretty much in control. You know, and that's great. God's, uh, we're a little deeper in the flow of God's will, but we're still not there yet. And the next one, the waist deep water. You know, we're in training for, for really that total submission to God's will in our lives. We've reached that point where we're no, we're starting to realize we're no longer in control, but we haven't quite got, jumped into the deep end of the pool, right? And lastly, the water above our head requires total surrender to God's will. And that's where God wants us. And the funny thing is, is God is faithful and he is able, although we might have lost control, he finally can be in complete control because uh, here's a little uh, newsflash. He's still on the throne and he's still in control. So regardless of you submit or you don't submit, he's still in control. But I tell you what, until that moment that we fully surrender and we fully submit to God's will, we're never whole, are we? We've never reached our, that full uh, relationship with God, that full intimacy with him. But he wants us to be completely out of control. Let's be an out of control Christians. Let's be an out of control church. Let's go deeper. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. God, I, I just thank you for the uh, way it speaks to our hearts. Lord, I pray as, as individuals and as a church, you would help us to go deeper. Lord, that you would help us to lose control so that you can be in control. And God, if there is any in this room that um, you know, would like to go deeper, Lord, I pray that today would be that day. Lord, if there's some that are not even at the river on the bank yet, Lord, they never accepted you as their Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray that today would be the day of their salvation. So God, I just thank you for all that you're doing in and through this church. Lord, once again, we thank you for who you are and we thank you for your word. Lord, uh, we just pray that as Pastor Aaron comes up to speak on baptism, Lord, that your spirit would just continue to move through him. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. So like I said, while Pastor Aaron talks about baptisms, I'm going to run upstairs, get changed, and then we'll be down here. Well, you can yell. Okay, is this on? Can everyone hear me? No? No? <laughs> Thanks, Nate. So, one of the things that I was taking a note when Pastor Troy was, or excuse me, Pastor Kevin was talking, was in verse 5, if you go back to Ezekiel, it says, Again, he measured 1,000, and it was a river that I could not cross. The I there is speaking of Ezekiel. It was much like when the children of Israel came up to the Jordan River at flood stage. They could not cross it. There was no way. It was about two miles wide, and it was going at about 3,500 CPM. Okay? So unless a miracle happened, they could not cross that river. And what this was talking about is when they took the ark, and the priest stepped into that water, it says that the water stopped all the way back to the city of Adam. And I'm amazed that it said Adam, because it's a picture of the old man, who we are in Adam. It was stopped back to there. And then they could cross over by the Spirit. So what baptism is, is it's a picture where you take the eye out and you rely completely on the Spirit. He already quoted, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So baptism is a picture of when we step into that water, much like here, we're walking into something that we are a part of. 
It speaks of Jesus' life. The water speaks of, of his life. And as we go down under the water, it's a picture of us being crucified with Christ, buried of the old. Okay? It speaks of death, being united together in the likeness of his death. And when we come out of that water, it's a picture of new life or resurrected life. And we now begin to walk and live and breathe and have our perspective and have values and conceptions that we've never had before because our thoughts begin to line up with the thoughts that are Christ. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. And so what baptism is all about is it's an outward expression of faith that has taken place in our heart. Okay, it's nothing that saves us, but it's an act of what has happened already in the spiritual realm. It says if we confess with our mouth, that's, that's, in, this, that's in the temporary, but believe in our heart, we will be saved. So day on to day, we confess every single day that we need to be saved. See, I need to be saved at the very beginning. That was called justification. I am saved from the penalty of sin. But I need to be saved every single day from the presence of sin from the worldly influences in my life, I need to be saved. So I call upon him every single day and say, I need to die daily. I need to be identified in your death daily, Paul says. So when he says, I have been crucified with Christ, that is a picture of what happens when we symbolize our, in the death, burial, and life of Jesus Christ. So that's what baptism is all about. And, uh, not sure where Kevin's at. He's probably, he's, you there, Kevin? Maybe not. <laughs> so when, when Kevin gets down, that's, that's what's happening. And, and for those gentlemen, um, it's, it's, it's not necessarily just about following Jesus. This is about your identification with Jesus. And it's a very powerful symbolism of that I died so that he may live his life through me. And that's what baptism is all about. It's all about identification, okay? And Pastor Kevin is be there, so we will just turn the microphone over to Kevin. So as we get ready to enter in this time of baptism, you know, it's kind of interesting. I, as I was changing, I was thinking about just the symbolism of what we're getting ready to do. Um, you know, the message God gave me was kind of perfect for this, you know, uh, as we submerse ourselves in God's word and in his love and we go deeper it's you know kind of like the baptism isn't it you know where we're uh, fully over our head and, and allowing God to wash away the sins uh, you know that so easily ensnares us so I'm excited for these baptisms and we will get the first person in here hello <laughs> No, it feels good, doesn't it? Your name? What's your name? I'm going blank. Oh, I'm sorry. Sue. Suzanne. All right. We have Suzanne here. And so, Suzanne, uh, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I know. And you're going to follow him all the days of your life? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to turn you around here. So with that... Hold, let me hold your hand. And with that being said, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Anybody want to be baptized who never has, it's not too late. Come on. Mom, you can come up on the stage if you would like. <laughs> 
So, uh, I love your shirt you got on, Monaco. It says, not today, Satan. Amen. I can't think of a better shirt to be baptized in, right? <laughs> so, Monaco, you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Okay. And you're going to follow him the rest of your life? Yes. All right. Well, then I'm going to turn you over this way. I'm going to grab your hand. And I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Woo! Oh, 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 oh. Your, congratulations. Your mom told me to hold you down longer. You could have. <laughs> but we get, wait, there's more. I think. Yes, there's two. Oh, two more. Okay. I hear Pastor Aaron talking about the significance of baptism probably to the next one. So give us just a moment here. This is not one of those things you want to rush. So. So after these are over, um, we do rent this out as a hot tub later. It's about 102 <laughs> degrees, so you ready? <sighs> All of a sudden, I'm nervous. Okay. I'm never nervous, ever. That's just the Spirit of God working in <sighs> This is Jeremiah, I need a cry baby. <laughs> now I love um, just watching the spirit move in people's lives. And so Jeremiah, I know we've had several conversations and have prayed several times. Um, I know the case here, but I'm gonna ask it anyways. Have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Always and forever. And you understand um, the significance of baptism because I know Pastor Aaron went over with you. So. Uh, are you going to follow him the rest of your life? Always and forever. All right, with that being yeah. said, right. then I... I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh. Oh. Was that it, or do we got one more? One more. We got one. Oh. <laughs> What's up, buddy? What's up? So, I know you've heard this spiel three times now, but you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Of course. All right, and you're going to follow him all of your days? Of course. Well, then, it'll be my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's it, right? Yeah, that's it. Okay, so well, I want to thank you all for uh, celebrating what God's doing in and through the lives of those who got baptized. And uh, God is good and He's moving. Amen? Amen. Have a great Sunday. We'll see you tonight. <laughs>